Um, but I want to thank everybody for coming out today. I think we have a really good um, training here. This is our second native plant landscaping series training. The first one we held at Kiowa Island Town Hall. Um, and so I'm not, I know a few people went to the first one. Can you raise your hands if you attended the first event at Town Hall? Okay, so a lot of, a lot of people coming back. Um, so this is really based on design. So the first one was talking a lot about the plant specific and the benefit of plants. And now we're gonna really get into how you can design with native plants. Um, I wanna first highlight some of the resources that we have that you've seen um, at the last event. And we have scattered throughout here are templates that were created by Circulus Design, which is a um, landscape architect firm that focuses a lot on nature-based solutions and native plants. Um, we have a QR code to our native plant guide that includes all of these templates. It also includes the plants that you see here today that we're going to be um, using in the design. And all the information related to these specific plants can be found in that native plant guide. And so the plants that we chose today are based on um, our experience at our Naturally Kiowa demonstration garden at Night Heron Park, um, which is just down the road. So we've installed all of these plants. We've had really good success. Um, and, and typically the deer don't eat these as much, even though you'll, you'll ha you know, hear people that say that they planted these and the deer have eaten them. So there's really nothing that's 100% deer proof here on Kiowa, but we're really working to find plants that do better. Um, and then uh, finding ways to, to kind of discourage deer to eat your plants, like spraying with um, deer repellent and deer spray, um, natural remedies to kind of discourage them. Um, we also have a QR code for our native plant sale that is going to be May 18th. Uh, these are pre-order plant packages, um, and these are going to be offered at cost, um, so they're wholesale pricing, um, and those will be available for pickup on the 18th of May at Night Heron Park. And so the op um, they're o available right now to purchase. Today's the first day, so you all will be the first people to be able to order them. Uh, and these are wild supplies last. Last year we sold around 93 packages for 4,600 plants. Uh, and we, we really have the capacity to maybe double or triple that this year. So um, we're really encouraging everybody to, to purchase those if you'd like. Um, this is all part of a series to try to get uh, homeowners to be really um, enthusiastic about native plants and, and try to find solutions um, to make it easier for homeowners to plant native. And so these first three trainings are going to be focused towards homeowners. And then we're going to start a, a new series that's going to be focused specifically on contractors and landscape professionals. Um, we know a lot of people here will garden themselves, but a lot of people in this area um, rely on uh, landscape professionals after um, either they install them or, or to maintain them. So that is a, um, a real struggle that we've noticed that there's not a lot of education for the landscapers about native plants. And that's something that um, the Cable Conservancy and the Seabrook Island Green Space Conservancy are working to try to solve some of those issues. Uh, I want to introduce Jennifer Weaver. She is a um, horticulturalist and a Clemson Extension agent out of, um, she lives in Columbia. Um, she has her territory in Aiken and Lexington counties. Um, and so we're happy to have her um, down here in Kiowa to go over um, landscape design principles. Uh, we're also going to have Zach Stipes who just arrived. Um, he is the Charleston, Dorchester County and Berkeley and Beaufort, and Berkeley and Beaufort um, Clemson Extension agent. Um, and they're both going to kind of um, go over landscape design. I'm going to first start with Zach, and he's going to get into the principles of um, what to look for before you start design. Cool. Thanks, Sean. Thank you all for coming out today. I'm really excited about this event. Um, really excited about you being interested in this. Um, I'm going to talk about soil sampling. I know it's not the sexiest thing to talk about, but whatever Jennifer says today, don't listen to it. It doesn't matter if you don't soil sample. All right. Any idea why soil sampling is so important? Nutrients? All great answers. All right. So if we don't soil sample, we don't know what's there. And if we don't know what's there, then we're going to spend a bunch of money and time and energy planting plants. For what reason? Okay. My job, typically I work with commercial farmers. And it's a lot of money when you're planting 100 acres or something if you don't spend $6 to soil sample. $6, y'all. That's all you got to do. You bring it to our office. We'll mail it up to Clemson for you. It goes to our soils lab. They'll analyze it. Within two weeks, you'll get a report back. And it will tell you a handful of things. It will tell you pH. 
which is probably the most important thing that's often overlooked. I don't care if you have 3,000 dump truck loads of fertilizer. If you put it on your property and your pH is off, it's not going to take up those nutrients. Okay, so pH is critically important. Most of our soils around here are acidic, but being here, you might be a little bit different because we're close to what? The ocean. What happened a couple million years ago? What was here? Ocean, crabs and crustaceans and things with shells, okay? And so we could have some carbon or calcium um, type soils around this area. So that's why it's really important to soil sample. Um, to soil sample, all you need is a little trowel, shovel, whatever suits your fancy. Um, what you want to do is you want to go around on your property and you want to take 10 to 12 small samples, okay? And then you're going to mix those together for one big sample. And once you do that, we need about two cups of soil that you're going to bring to our office, okay? And when you go down in the soil and dig, I want you to think about what you're planting because that determines the depth of where you need to take your soil sample. So if we're doing turf, how far do you think we need to go down? No, like, like that far, okay? If you look at turf's roots, very, very small root system, okay? I hate turf. I'm not a fan of turf. I understand if you guys are, um, but um, turf has a very weak root system, very shallow root system, so you're going to want to take shallow samples. If you're planting more uh, native plants or ornamentals, you want to go down a little farther, maybe three to six inches, because that's where a concentration of your roots are going to be, okay? So I guess we could do it here. That's yeah, good. Mm -hmm. So can you hold this for me? Do you want to clip on this? Oh, this is what this is. That's it. A clipper owner. Does that, does that work? Yeah. That's just for the recording. Oh, the recording. Ah, still got to use this. Gotcha. Um, so there's not much to it, uh, but what you want to do, you want to pull back the pond straw, the mulch, um, and get kind of that top layer of duff is what we call out of it. Okay, so now we're into this native soil, and I can tell right now it's really sandy, okay? So we're going to kind of go down. I like to open up the soil profile, kind of look at what I'm taking a sample of. And I would take that right there and I put it in a five gallon bucket. Okay. And then I would do it right over there. And then I would do it over there and over there. And I would do it 10 to 12 times. Okay. Mix it all up and then bring about two cups in a Ziploc bag, Rubbermaid container, whatever to our office. And we'll send it off. The cool thing is um, our lab or at our office will code it for whatever crop or plant you're growing. So if you're growing St. Augustine, We'll code it for St. Augustine, so it'll give you a recommendation for growing St. Augustine. If you're doing blueberries, we'll give you a code for doing blueberries. If you're doing natives, ornamentals, so you can really dial in what nutrients you need for what plants you need, okay? And then it's going to give you the recommendations. It'll tell you exactly how much lime or how much sulfur to use, what type to use. It'll tell you how much of a certain fertilizer to use in a certain area if you want to. And we also have organic recommendations if you want to stay organic. So incredibly important resource, incredibly important thing to do for any type of garden. Okay. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting that a lot of people don't take advantage of, and here I think they probably brought in a lot of soil uh, to build these houses, to, to build them up. But the federal government back in the 1970s did a soil survey of all of continental U.S. And so there's an app and also a web based thing you can type your address in and it tells you what the soil type is on your property and it actually it's they took millions of samples and you can actually see the contours of where it is and if you're really nerdy like me and are looking for something to do on friday night <laughs> you can read about those soil types and how they were created eons and eons ago um, here you're going to have a lot of dunes you're going to have a lot of uh, behind the dunes um, there's certain fancy geological words for that but um, you can find out why your soil <clears throat> is the way it is in certain spots. And it also tells you the properties and characteristics of that soil. It's very sandy. It's very loamy. It's typically X percent um, clay or loam or whatever. And then it will tell you how well it drains, how well it floods, how deep it is to the next uh, profile within that soil. Super nerdy, way too much information, but I think it's really cool. Um, that we collected that information years and years ago and it's available and free 
for everyone to take advantage of. So um, if you just go online and type in um, web soil survey, and the app is called, give me a second, I used it this morning. It blows farmers' minds when I'm like, oh, this is a Seabrook soil. They're like, how do you know that? And I'm like, <laughs> yep, that's it. Yep. What that stands for. NRCS stands for Natural Resources Conservation Service. Okay. So it came out of the, uh, back in the day, you've heard of the Dust Bowl? <laughs> All right, so that, that was a, a program created uh, because of the Dust Bowl uh, to preserve some of our land and, and soil and water. Do they still, uh, uh, when you, you build, do they consider that? When um, the engineers, um, we'll use it uh, for planning, um, and you've heard the term perk. So they'll use that sometimes to kind of get an idea if a piece of ground will perk, um, and then they'll go do and further testing on it, pull pull records and stuff. The app is called Soil Web App. If you're interested, if you're interested of what the soil we're standing on is, it says it's water. My GPS coordinates might be a little off, or they brought a lot of fill in. We, we have all those soils for, for Kiowa Island um, Seabrooks. If anybody has trouble with that, they can always email. You can email me, sean at kiowaconservancy.com, uh, .org, sorry, and um, we can get you that information if you can't find it on the app. Okay. Cool. Did that leave anything out? You want me to talk about anything else? Um, you want to just talk about a jar test real quick? Yeah. Um, so what a jar test is, um, is basically we'll uh, dig down into the soil profile. Um, we'll put that, and I can send you information on how to do it exactly, but you put it in a mason jar uh, with water and you'll shake it up and mix everything up. And then within a few minutes, you'll get a sand profile. So it'll be a distinct line of sand. And then within a few hours, you'll get a, a loam or silt layer. And then after that, you'll get a clay layer. And so what you do is you mark it on the jar and you can kind of estimate without using the soil web survey, or if you want to be nerdy and kind of compare the two to see if they're right, you can get an idea of what uh, percentage sand, silt, and clay are in your soil. And that's going to go a long way in plant selection, which I think Chris talked about, and Jennifer's probably going to talk a lot about that too, is finding the right plant for the right place. So if you have a lot of, of clay in your soil, you probably don't want something that's, you know, evolved to grow on a sand dune right and vice versa so that can go a long way in your your plant selection and how you manage things if you got a sandy soil you're gonna to have to water a lot more if you got a clay soil it holds a lot more water so you're not gonna to have to water it as much um, that also kind of relates to the diseases so if you got a heavier soil you're gonna hold more water so you got more pathogens that could cause root rots and things and so if you look at all the pieces of the puzzle um, having all these tools like the jar test your soil test the soil web survey can go along and a long way in putting that puzzle together. Yes, sir. So, uh, I'm sorry, not directly to what you just said, but what you said before, when you, when you get this recommendation for lime or whatever uh -huh. other, uh, uh, nutrients you need to add, do you need to then work it into the soil, or will it find its way? To, you, you know, you said uh, turf just going in. Yep. Or go down six inches. Yep. You need to work it down to that six inch level. Uh, um, it doesn't matter, but it's going to be a lot more effective if it gets in the soil because that's where that, that, process, that biological process is happening in the soil. And so if you just top dress it and let it rain and wash in, it's, going to, it's probably going to take, I don't know, like six months or a year before you see that pH change like you want it. If you worked it into the soil, it's going to be more like four to six months. So, yep. Uh, when you send in the soil sample, uh -huh. where, where do you, where's your office? <laughs> so, <laughs> our office is at 259 Meeting Street, so you can come downtown, you can take me out to lunch, um, you can struggle to find parking in our office, but uh, y'all know where Red Top Feed and Seed uh, was previously and still there, but they're not operating anymore? Um, right on the um, on Highway 17 when you come off the Maybach Bridge, if you take a left right there, there's an old timey feed and seed store. The Not Maybank, Limehouse, yep. Yeah. Um, there's an old timey feed and seed store right there. There's a black mailbox out front. You can drop your samples off there. Just make sure you write your name and your number and our admin checks that box twice a week and she will call you for payment. So you don't have to come downtown. Okay, and when we say... No, so the good news is with um, ornamentals, the 
fertility recommendations are pretty similar. And so it's not gonna matter that big of a difference between, you know, coneflower and, you know, something else. So you will put um, ornamentals in there. All right, I think you were next. Um, I was just, we just had this done, and um, the soil samples you take is a good response to my property. But I wondered, how do you know which discrete part of the property? I mean, is, can you safely assume that it is all the same? Yes and no. The general recommendation is one soil sample is good for 15 acres, but that's in a farming situation. What I tell people is it's probably going to be pretty similar throughout your property, but like let's say here, you know it's really sandy. Maybe you're on an old sand dune, but in the back it's like marshy and mucky. And I would probably do two samples because you know there's differences there. Yep. Okay, perfect. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to say that if someone decides to go downtown mm -hmm. and it comes up on your GPS as the senior center. Yes. Senior center. Yep. Center. Yep. You're going to the right place. Yep, so we're upstairs at the Senior Citizen Center. You can, hey, you kill two birds in one stone. You get to play bingo, you get a free meal, and then you can come up and get a soil sample. That's the best $6 you can spend. You know, thinking my GPS is off. Yeah, and our, um, our office, um, when COVID happened, we had a lot of issues in our parking lot, and the people that managed the property put up a gate. So you'll have to find street parking or park in a garage, unfortunately. So... If you want to save yourself some headache, just drop them off at Red Top Feed and Seed. <laughs> All right. Take a, one one more question. Again? Okay. What, who do you work for again? I'm sorry. Uh, Clemson Extension. Clemson. Yep. So we're in every county in the state. Um, we have horticulture agents, water resources agents, 4-H agents, agronomy agents, livestock agents, rural health. Sound like Bubba Gump up here, um, <laughs> but basically we are a free resource. You guys pay taxes. You pay for us. Um, and we're here to serve you guys and take the research that the university is doing um, and bring it to y'all for free to make your lives better. So, so you don't watch YouTube and Instagram to get your gardening advice because there's some bad advice out there. All right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jennifer Weaver. And like they said, I am the urban horticulture agent and I work in Lexington and Aiken counties. I'm also the master gardener coordinator there, and I'm also a certified arborist. So I appreciate you inviting me down today to talk about landscape design because it's my passion. I've had my own landscape design business about 28 years in Columbia, South Carolina, and I find myself, if I'm visiting a nursery or a garden center, I find myself listening to people's conversations, and if I see them struggling, you know, trying to make a decision on whether to buy a plant or not, I find myself having to go up to them and I just feel obligated to help them because they might be looking at this beautiful, you know, flowering plant from Oregon and I know that that's not going to do well in their climate down here where we have a lot of heat and humidity, so I'm glad to help anyone, you know, whenever they have the questions about that. So, um, so uh, Zach talked about the soil analysis and we're going to talk about some things to help you plan your landscape design. Um, first, we're going to talk about site analysis, some things to look at before you start to plant. You always want to delineate your property line because a story that I like to tell people, um, my mom lives over in Hartsville and her neighbor, she looked out there one morning and her neighbor was planting shrubs in her yard. So she had to go out there and you know, share with them that they were a little bit over the property line, so they had to move those. So find out the boundaries of your yard and make sure you look at any setbacks or easements. Um, there's a service drive next to my yard in Columbia, and I'm not supposed to plant within 15 feet of the center line of that driveway to allow you know, trucks and things to come in. So you always want to check and see if you have any setbacks on your property. Um, and then you want to look at opportunities or constraints that you might have in your yard. Um, I like to call them opportunities or constraints because sometimes if you have a slope or a creek, you know, you might see that as a constraint, but I see it as an opportunity, you know, to plant some uh, creek side plants, you know, something uh, really interesting like that. So just take a look at the things that your yard has to offer. Um, you may 
have a fence, you may have a swimming pool, you may have outcropping of boulders, which we have a lot in Columbia. You might not have that many down here, but we have a really rocky, I live near the river in Columbia, so we have lots of clay and stones. So sometimes we're able to make use of those features. Um, and next you wanna define your space. Do you want to grow a shade garden? Or are you gonna have a perennial garden? Or is your space gonna be an open area where you want to you know, have a place for your children to play? Or is it gonna be underneath some trees um, you know, where they wanna put their swing set or you wanna have a shade and perennial garden over there? Um, also, you might wanna provide some screening. If you have a back deck and you know, close neighbors, you might wanna provide some screening or screen off some air conditioning units. So there's a lot of different reasons you know, that people do their landscaping. So you need to consider you know, the specific um, reason that you want to do your landscaping. And one thing that I like to use um, or talk to people about when we do our landscape design is can you phase your project? Some people want to have a master plan and then implement it over time. And I think that's a great idea because not too many people can do the whole installation all at one time. So I like to, you know, say, hey, let's delineate your beds or let's do the front foundation. And then as you have some more time and funds, then you can work on other areas of your landscape. It's very important to um, take note of where does the sun shine in your yard. Down here, you'll have lots of shade. In Columbia, everybody wants to clear cut every neighborhood so nobody has any shade up there. So it's, it's a challenge for both, you know, using things out in the full sun and um, in these shady areas where you have a lot of root competitions. So those are always both challenging, but you do want to make sure because we wouldn't want to use this wooden woodland flocks out in a hot, dry, full sun area because it prefers you know, filtered shade. So you do want to take a look at where the sun shines in your yard. Um, I like to recommend that people make sure you know how you're going to be able to irrigate these landscape uh, plantings. Are the, you're going to be able to use your automatic sprinkler system or are you going to have to pull a hose out there? Um, if you aren't going to be able to water as often, maybe you want to choose something that's a little more drought tolerant than is if you had an irrigation system that's, you know, you could just turn the switch on and it gets water every day. So that'll help you um, in your selections. Um, maybe you have a focal point in your yard. Maybe a beautiful live oak is gonna be the center of attention in your garden, or maybe you want to, you know, put a bird bath or bird feed or, or some other art, sculpture, something out in your yard. Maybe you want to have a focal point in your yard. That's another reason. Or your front door. Maybe you want to make that your focal point as your friends and neighbors are coming to visit. I also like to tell people, think about maintenance. Do you want to be out there trimming shrubs, deadheading roses, you know, things like that. You want to um, determine how much time you're willing to spend out there. Some people love, you know, going out and deadheading every morning. So just think about the time that you want to put in to your landscape. And Zach mentioned, you know, maybe you have a big lawn. Maybe you love that and you're, you know, that's your pride and joy is having a, a nice lush green lawn. So just think about the time that's going to take to maintain your garden. Yeah, got a little sprinkle here. Okay, so uh, did everyone get a handout? Okay. Let's take a look at those. And um, I did want to tell you that we are going to be sending a PowerPoint presentation that's going to cover in detail some more of these things that I'm going over. Um, we're going to take a look at the principles and the elements of landscape design. And just because we go over these, that doesn't mean you have to include every one of these things like, you know, repetition or color or form. You don't have to use every one of these, but if you implement some of these, I think you'll have a much more aesthetically pleasing landscape. So first, let's take a look at the principles and elements of design. Um, again, I gave you a handout that kind of describes a little bit more about balance, proportion, scale, 
Those are some things that you would um, need to consider. Those are the guidelines that govern the organization of the elements and materials in your yard. Um, rhythm, that just helps you, that's how your eye moves through the landscape. Balance, you can have a formal balance or you can have informal balance. Scale, I like to think of human scale. How are you going to feel in that space um, when you're viewing your landscape? And we talked about maybe having a focal point, maybe a bird bath or your front entrance. Um, harmony, you want to use harmonious colors. And we have some examples up on the front. Um, and this garden that I visited, they use some of these beautiful mauves and pinks and maroon colors. Those are harmonious colors. Um, so look at that. Um, some people like to use multicolored azaleas and things like that for instance for instance but I prefer you know using some more harmonious colors like we have in some of these examples. Um, also repetition it's very important to kind of unify the whole landscape and that's why when we lay these out we're going to use some flocks on this side and some flocks on that side to kind of tie your landscape together repeating some of the same elements in your landscape. All right, next, the elements of design are those things that you can directly observe in your landscape and the physical characteristics of design. Um, those are things like line, form, space, texture, and I brought a sample of plant material from my yard. It's not necessarily all native. I try to use a lot more natives than I used to, um, but I had to kind of go with the plans that were at my in my yard when I moved in there. So I've tried to use a lot more natives in there, but I brought some examples of those and they'll show you different textures that I use in my yard, different colors, uh, variegated shrubs and maroon colored shrubs. So take a look at those if you have a chance. Um, and one thing to note is that you can get color other than just using flowers. So I brought some examples of some different colors of foliage that I use, some variegated things, and some maroon colored foliage. So you can get color other ways other than just, you know, using your flowering shrubs. All right, let's see what's next. And I think when you look through the presentation, these will kind of come together a little bit more because I use some examples, you know, for each one like texture, repetition, unity, forms. Um, I like to use different forms in the landscape. I like to use some upright things like maybe a cast iron plant and I like to use large textured leaves. Some of these yucca that we're going to be using, those have the wide leaf. They look nice, you know, with fine textured leaves like some of these you find in your yopon hollies here. So vary the color and the texture. Um, try using different forms, like I was just saying, you know, use rounded forms, upright forms. Um, I think those add a lot of interest. Make sure to repeat things throughout your landscape. That kind of ties it together. Um, and I like to plan for something interesting in every season of the year. So I like to use, you know, very early bulbs, like some of your woodland hyacinths. Those are really beautiful. I have a few of those in my yard that were blooming this spring. And maybe something that blooms a little bit later, early, early summer, late summer. And then I have some beautiful native asters in my yard that bloom every fall. And one nice thing about those is that they spread underground. And I don't do anything to them all year, um, but then they come up looking really beautiful in the fall. So I like to use things that reseed or you have know, self sowing or spread underground. Um, so I do like to use things all seasons of the year. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention was plant in odd numbers. Most of you have probably heard that before. Those are just more aesthetically pleasing, I think, when you use groups of three and five. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use three hollies, for instance. You could use two hollies and maybe one specimen shrub, but that's still a group of three. So try to use odd numbers when you're planting. And something that we're going to 
get y'all to help us with in just a minute is proper spacing of plants. I can't tell you how many problems that people bring in to our office where things are planted, they're overcrowded, they've been sheared back, and they're just way too close together. When I moved into my house, I had taken 25 plants away from my foundation because my windows are about two feet off the ground and they had used Cliera and Laura Pedlum, all these non-native species and things that get 25 feet tall. So I took all those out. That's the first thing I did was take um, all those plants out. And I tell a lot of my customers that. They're like, oh, my house is just overgrown. It looks terrible. I don't have much money. Well, the first thing we do is just remove all the overgrown shrubs, and that makes such a big difference. And just put some mulch down and just use a few accent shrubs. That's a good way to get started. But it's very, very time consuming to have to spend most of your time out there shearing plants that were put in the wrong place. So try to make sure when you go to the nursery to select your plants, read that tag on there. And if it says two to four feet spread, I plan at least four feet apart. And that way it may look small at first, but it's gonna grow in. And um, like I was saying, that's gonna cut down on your disease problems where things, you know, gonna have better air circulation. That cuts down a lot of problems if you just use proper spacing. Um, you also want to make sure that, I think Zach touched on this, make sure you choose a plant that's going to live in the environment you have. So we're not going to get this beautiful hemlock from Greenville, you know, that loves that kind of climate and try to use it down here where we have a lot of heat and humidity. Make sure you look at the zone requirements for your plant and make sure that it's suited for the zone that you live in. Um, so in a minute we're going to use our tape measure and I put some spacing um, on the plant list that I'm going to hand you and if it says it gets two to four feet wide I'm going to give y'all opportunity to practice that in the landscape and we're going to help get y'all to help us space these out properly. Um, let's see. All right, so let's, let's take a look on the back of your sheet. Um, it just gives you a few more um, detailed reasons of why to use natives. Um, they are better adapted to our local environment. Again, if you use the hemlock from Greenville, it's not gonna really tolerate the heat and humidity down here. So these native plants, we know that they're gonna thrive down here because this is their native habitat. They can take the drought that we have in late summer they can take some of the humidity that we have. And also, it um, supports our local wildlife. Um, I've noticed a lot of landscapes. I worked at a school and they wanted to start a garden there. But I noticed when I went out, I didn't see any bees or butterflies or birds. And that was because they were all introduced species. There were no native plants, you know, for the bees to visit. And the birds weren't coming there, you know, to eat the berries off of different kinds of plants. So. It was a very sterile environment, and then when we started planting some more natives, it was incredible how the wildlife just started flocking to that. So you want to support the wildlife in your area also. Um, and natives, you know, they help with water conservation because they live in our environment. They don't take a lot of extra water like some of the introduced species. So they're going to help with water conservation. Uh, we talked about improving biodiversity. Um, and many insects depend on our native plants. Um, and if you have a few little feeding insects, I don't mind that. Um, I kind of tolerate it because I know maybe a bird that's living in my yard is going to eat that little insect and that's going to provide food for their brood. So you want to support all different kinds of um, different kinds of wildlife in your yard. Uh, we talked about choosing the right plant for your site. Make sure it's um, zoned for the area that you live in um, and make sure that you can meet the plants needs for light water and nutrients um, we tried to put some of these plants that like a little bit more Sun in some of the spots that we know it's going to be a little bit more sunny and some of the woodland flocks we use in um, some of the more shady areas um, not all natives are good candidates so make sure that if you just have a small area where you want to grow a 
plant that it's not going to be really invasive and you're going to be pulling it out of all your other plants. But if you want to use that area in another spot where it has places to roam, you know, so make sure you look at the cultural requirements and the spacing, you know, just read up on everything about that plant so you make sure you use it in the right space. Yep, consider the mature size of plant. We talked about that. If it says two to four feet, you know, allow four feet for that plant to spread. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was plant, I like to plant in layers. So we use some low growing flocks, it's more like a ground cover. And then we use some of uh, the yuccas and other things that's, that are going to get about two to four feet tall. So you want to have a lower layer, a middle layer, and these palms are good for the understory layer. And then you have the beautiful canopy layer. So I think that makes it really interesting if you can use you know, different layers of plants. Um, sometimes I like to plant on a berm. If I have some showy plants that I want to show off, I'll raise that bed up a little bit. So that's always an option. Um, and remember that prevention is the best medicine, so make sure that you space things properly, and use them in the right environment. Um, those things are going to help you not use as many pesticides and do less maintenance. Um, so keep those in mind. Um, so I think that about wraps up my presentation on landscape design. Are there any questions before we get to laying out some of our plants? Yes, ma'am. So a question about protecting your plant's root system and when we have um, the water table or you know these events like we had a big one in December with the, with the flooding and it comes into your yard and, right. and it may actually drown the roots, I understand, if they don't get oxygen for a certain period of time because of water. And I, I think we've lost things like uh, lantana which and, and crepe myrtle. I don't know that either of those are natives, but is there anything native or non that can, that, that can account for that as we have those kinds of water events that are affecting the roots system? So she was asking a question about um, water table or maybe events where your yard may stay flooded f for certain times. Um, and there are certain plants that cannot tolerate what we call wet feet and they'll rot very quickly in that situation. So if you maybe are in an area that's prone to flooding, you might want to choose plants, you know, like papyrus, for instance. I'm not sure if y'all use that down here or not. You know, something like that would certainly tolerate that water fluctuation better than other things. I think the lantana would quickly root, root, have some root rot if you used it in that kind of environment. Can, can I just add something? Sure, to sure, please. So we're seeing that happen a lot more frequently. Um, tidal inundation, so you're getting the saltwater intrusion, um, you know, and inundation. So on top, and then you have saltwater coming underneath. And so we really suggest you look at the um, the Clemson Extensions living along the salt marsh, they have a whole website that talks about what plants you can put in that are salt tolerant and specifically geared towards plants that are found naturally along the salt marsh edge. And so those plants have a really deep root system. They hold the soil in, which will help prevent erosion. So there's really benefit in adding um, native plants that are meant to be in the salt marsh. We're working on um, taking the plants that are on that guide from Clemson Extension and putting them into our native plant guide. So that will be updated oh, soon. Great. Um, but we know that's a really big problem, um, and that's why we really suggest native plants because the, the right plant, a native plant found along the salt marsh, is not going to die if you have a, mm. um, you know, a tidal event. Now, if you have frequent standing water, there's only really a couple plants that can, that can stand that, like the Spartina in the marsh specifically. But... There's a lot of plants that can withstand um, infrequent flooding from the salt marsh. And Zach actually works in his um, private capacity doing shoreline restoration. Um, his company is called the Shoreline Restoration Group. Is that correct, Zach? And so that's a big focus is using native plants to restore um, your salt marsh edge or your pond edge that's seeing erosion. And it's really all about picking the right native plant for that area. Uh, along those same lines, we have a website, um, Carolina Yards, and you can go on there and say, you know, I have a shady plant, uh, location, I want the plant to be two to four feet tall, 
and it will give you some recommendations on there. So take advantage of that. It's called Carolina Yards Database, Plant Database. Well, yes. Were thinking about the beautiful birds and bees and, and, and butterflies, but what about these moles that come up? Uh -huh. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, a lot of people have trouble with that, voles and moles. Um, I've heard, you know, some people use baits for those. I'm not sure that's really successful, though. Um, got any suggestions on that? Uh, and let you Zach. Mean Jack Russell Terrier. <laughs> 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 Any other suggestions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the, bait, the baits work by basically they kill all the food source, um, like the grubs. Yeah, because they're after the grubs. So yeah. all you're going to do is kill those and you're going to send them to your neighbor's property. <laughs> and as soon as the poison wears off, they're going to come back. So, what I've found down here is they're only active a few months out of the year. So, if you just turn your head and don't look at it, Maybe going on a long vacation. <laughs> you want to see some Depends photos? Where they go. You can also just think they're aerating the soil. There you go. Uh, that's, that's right. Line. Beneficial. Yeah. Did you have something? Yeah, they're, they're, and they're eating grubs. Yeah. Yes, that's right. The only right. thing I would mention is to if you're if you're going to to use um, a company to try to get rid of them, that you're using a company that's a, a bobcat guardian. So you're not using the um, rodenticides that could be really negative to the uh, bobcat population and other, um, you know, the wildlife population. So there's there's ways to control for that that's not as detrimental to other wildlife. I read something that said um, the noise from a, a wind chime oh. would irritate them and, you know, they would, like, leave that area. I, I haven't tried it. But I did read that. <laughs> interesting, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> you are right. Any, any? Right, right. No, check back in with you. Some of them, though, you know, I'm like, yeah, maybe. It's got some merit to it, maybe. Hmm. All right, anybody else have any other questions before we lay out our plants? Okay. Yes. But I have a septic field, and I'm not a fan of turf. So, what native thing can I plant over my septic field that will be low maintenance and do what it needs to do? I think any of your ornamental grasses they have a pretty shallow root system, and they're pretty low maintenance. I have. Um, a couple of muley grass plants in my yard, and I just cut them back once a year, and they pretty much take care of themselves the rest of the year. Um, any ground cover, I would think, you know, like some of the uh, plants that we're using here today, usually don't go much deeper than I'd say four or six inches at the very most. Sedges? Sedges? Sedges. Sedges. Car Car mm -hmm. Charleston Aquatics and Environmental, which is right here on Johns Island. They have a, a, a large variety of um, native ground cover grasses that you could use. Um, and if you order, you know, a few hundred, um, that, yeah, they're a wholesaler. So you could work with me um, and we could, we could figure out a way. If you're doing a really large planting, we can um, get those grasses for you. And that would be in a small container too, Correct. if you yeah, order like a little four inch pot maybe. Correct. And they have plugs, mm -hmm. um, so you can get, you know, 50 plugs for $50 as yeah. opposed to $500, you know. So there's mm -hmm. ways to work with the landscaping company too. If you point them in the right direction, a lot of times, um, I mean, the wholesaler's right here, so. Can you say the name of it again? Char Charleston Environmental, uh, Charleston Aquatics and Environmental, um, and they are a wholesaler that they focus primarily on native plants, but they do have some, some non-natives, but they're all perennial plants. Um, again, they're a wholesaler, so you really need to work with a landscaping professional or, um, you know, for us, we're doing a, this installation here is on the smaller scale of what they'll allow, um, but we have a really good relationship. We're actually planting um, probably a thousand plants in this neighborhood, in this community. Um, just right down the road right here. Um, and so we're working with them to get the, the source. But they're really the only um, native plant nursery in the area wholesale. Roots and Shoots has native plants. Um, but they, So that's the only retail place uh, really it, for native plants is Roots and Shoots. Stan? Uh, you mentioned Charleston Aquatics. I don't know if this is the right time, but we're getting our plants for the plant sale coming up. Yeah. So... 
I mentioned the, the native plant sale that we're doing um, oh, yeah. May 18th. We're getting all of our plants from Charleston Aquatics because again, they're really the only place that we can get large quantities of native plants. Um, and so we're really lucky to have a wholesaler like that that has native plants here in Charleston. You really can't find that out um, really anywhere else um, in the area. So we're really lucky for that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well. <laughs> right, I have that question so often. Um, they are deer resistant, but that doesn't mean they're deer proof. And I've found in my yard that if that deer is hungry, he's going to eat just about any plant in my yard. So you can just try deer resistant plants. But yeah, so uh, that's a that's a tricky one there. We know that Seabrook, Johns Island, Kiowa have a really big deer population, and, and the, the towns are working on, the, you know, they cull the deer every year to try to reduce the population, but there's really no way around stopping them completely. Um, the plants that we suggest in our native plant guide, we've had better luck with than other plants. And so I know um, even the plants that we have here today, if the deer is hungry, they will, they mm -hmm. will eat them, but we also recommend spraying um, initially after the insulation deer sprays. There's um, three varieties that we typically use, um, and we like to rotate through those so the deer sometimes get used to one, and then we rotate to another one, and then um, we'll rotate to another one. And we're not spraying these every day. We spray them right after insulation. We'll spray them after a really big rainstorm. Um, but really when they're growing new and fresh like this is when they're most prone. Once they're more established, the deer tend to stay away from them more. Um, and we also suggest a lot of plants in the mint family. The deer don't tend to eat um, the, the plant species in, in mint uh, family. Do you have anything to add to that? What are the three types that you use? We have, I'd have to look back on that. We have it in our, um, in our native plant guide. We have a resource page, but I think it's um, deer stop. Um, Morgan, do you remember what the other? What was it? The deer resistant um, sprays uh, that we use. Liquid fence. Liquid deer fence, off. deer off. I don't want to misspeak, so we can check the, uh, the native plant guide. Um, please check out our Naturally Kiwa Demonstration Garden at Night Heron Park. If you want more examples of native plants, we have signs for all of the plants there. Um, and we really appreciate you helping us plant everything. Um, and thanks for coming out. Come back and check out the plants next year and see how they've done.